Hey guys, Thomas Porter with Porter Barnwood here, and I'm really excited because today we get to do a live workshop from here at Porter Barnwood. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about mantles and in particular I'm going to show you how to take a solid wood reclaimed beam like one of these guys and we're going to turn it into a mantle for your fireplace. Now there's a lot of ways to do that. You can make it completely clean and, and look really refined and true. You can take one that's maybe hand hewn like one of these guys and have all the, the hand hewn marks in the front. You can do a rough sawn beam. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it and so I'm going to show you some of the techniques in the shop in just a minute and we're going to show you how it's done. So follow along. There's big differences in reclaimed beams. Uh, the very first difference that you'll notice is that some are hewn and some are sawn. Now for those of you who don't know what that means, hewn is where you take these little tiny marks right here. They actually took the tree, laid it down, and they would use an adze, like an axe basically. And they would chip away at this thing until they got it square. It was all done by hand. And so some guy was standing over top of it just chopping away. Later they started to use a lot of sawmills and more production lumber became available and so you'll see stuff like this that's sawn. Now a lot of times those are more square than the hewn beams because you know the other ones are done by hand. But they both have really cool looks and so for today I think I'm gonna go and select mmm I think I'm gonna actually do one that has a live edge on the face. Uh, I'm gonna throw a wrench in it there. So these are hewn on the top and the bottom but the outside edges are, are the live edge of the material. So what's gonna be really cool is we'll have this really cool looking hewn top, really cool looking hewn bottom, and then this just organic looking live edge that's gonna be right off the face. I'm gonna go grab the forklift and we'll pull down a bundle and we'll pick one. So I see there's a pile of mantle sized hand hewn live edge face beams right here I'm gonna to get to. Now since I'm building this for a class and I have absolutely no place that I'm putting this, my dimensions are going to be very easy for me to find. But I want something that looks really cool. Look how cool this is. On the top, here's my hewn surface. On the other side I'm going to have a hewn surface, like this. And then right here I've got these really cool bulbous knobs and stuff and all this beetle hole action going on. This is a really cool old oak beam. And it's really dense. I like it. I think this will be great. If I flatten it just a little bit, I'll be able to get a little bit more out of this distance right here. We'll still end up with a little chunk of this knot. We might miss this one. And the other side, the other side looks cool too. Yeah. I don't know. Let's uh, let's see. If I if I straighten off the back side of this one, I'm gonna have a knot here. I'm gonna have this bulbous portion right here. I might even like this side better. Well, let's take it in the shop and, uh, and see what it looks like. All right, so the very first thing we're gonna do before we touch any tools whatsoever is to learn about PPE. Basically, when you're in the wood shop, you need to have safety glasses. It's really, really important. There's a few other tips and tricks that I'm gonna teach you along the way, but it's really important to stay safe because you don't wanna lose fingers, you don't wanna lose an eye. There's no reason you can prevent it. So, very first step is going to be wearing a good pair of safety glasses. Now, you might think, I can just wear my regular glasses. And in some cases that may be true, but you really need polycarbonate glasses of some kind to protect from things flying in and shattering and not destroying your eyes. So, make sure you're wearing a good pair of safety glasses. That is probably the most important thing I could tell you. Uh, secondly, don't wear gloves. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but even by OSHA standards, you are not supposed to wear gloves around woodworking machinery. The reason is, if you were to stick your hands in and you nipped a little of your finger off, so be it. If you stick your hand in and you've got a nice leather glove or something on, it's gonna take your entire hand in, and that's not fun. So don't wear gloves around power tools, be safe, read the manuals, do what you're supposed to do, and everything's gonna be just fine. So the first tool I'm gonna introduce you to is the jointer. Now the reason why the jointer is so important in our shop is because it makes very fast work of cleaning up and straightening the back edge of one of these beams. And with a live edge one, it's really wonky. So we need to be able to push it through this machine and flatten the back perfectly so it'll sit up nice and flat up against the wall. Now a jointer, if you come on around, 
What a jointer is, is basically like a planer blade that's in this table right here. You see that blade? Now on this side, this is your outfeed table, and the outfeed table stays the same all the time. It's, it's uh, static. This table is your infeed table, and if you'll notice, if I lower and raise this, you see the table drops. That comes up, table drops. What happens is the wood goes in this way, and once it hits here, this planer blade is taking off portions, and then the flat portion is here, and it's running past on this side. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to only take off a little bit at a time, and there's also another method I like to call frown side down. Now what that means is, if you have a board that is curving this way, like it's frowning, you put the frown side on your end feed table. That way, when you're pushing it through, you're taking off a corner, that corner rests nice and easy, you push through, you've got another corner. You set it down, you keep going, and you whittle away at it little by little until finally you've got a nice flat surface. Now if you were to do it on the smile side, you're going to rock it like a boat and it's not going to work. You're going to have toothpicks by the end of this thing because you've been running it through and running it through and it's rocked and it's gone back and forth and it's very difficult to get a straight piece of wood that way. So try to keep it frown side down. For this mantle, I'm going to use the joiner for two different things. Number one is I'm going to flatten the backside with it, which I'm probably going to do by eye because the mantle is curvy and moving and everything's different. And so I'm going to take that jointer and I'm going to flatten the backside. Then I want to have a nice perpendicular uh, plane to it. So I'm going to take that flattened side, put it up against my fence, and then I'm going to joint the other side so that I can get a perfect 90 degree. From there, I can take it to my planer. So let's go ahead. If you're around a joiner, it's a really great idea not to have long hair, not to have a necklace, not to have any loose clothes. So I'm gonna do a little tuckle. See, woodworkers were actually the original inventors of the tuckle because they don't wanna die. And so it actually had a purpose instead of just looking stupid. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on this machine now and here we go. What I'm doing is I'm taking down this nub that's on the end first. It's a very heavy piece of wood. All right. So I'm leaning it a little bit this way and I want to straighten it up. So I'm just gonna just barely twist it as I'm sending it through. Now it's flat and it's going to stay there for me. Make sure to keep your hands away from that blade. And don't throw your body balance off when you fall into it. Let's take a look. We're getting close. I have a lot more surface area here where we're gonna put our cleat. Probably got maybe one or two passes and we should be good. All right, so next up, I'm gonna use this side and I'm gonna start flattening out one of these edges. I might flatten out the other edge. And I don't wanna take a ton of it off. I just wanna get this flat so things can sit on it. I was running it pretty hard. I'm gonna take it to about an eighth of an inch. I'm gonna watch this fence back here. If you shoot down the fence, you'll see it's not quite square. Look straight down that fence, Jesse. Go to the end of the bed. Come straight down. And you can see right there, the top part is not lined up with the bottom. That means it's not square. I've gotta push it like that to square it up to the fence. So I'm gonna do that and send it through.
let's take a look. We're getting there. I can still take a little bit more. Now, you'll notice it's nice and clean, but I still have all these hand hewn marks, which is great. I think it's cool looking. So I'm gonna take it down until it's about perfect clean. Uh, maybe a little bit of this is showing and we'll see what kind of cool texture comes up. Got that nice surface right there. That looks cool and all the way out to the edge. That's gonna look really nice. I like it. Now, we need to figure out this other side, the top side. So for that, we're gonna run it through a planer. All right, so I'm gonna get one of the guys to help me out on the outfeed on this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up my planer. Now that I have a straight edge on the side, I've got a straight bottom, they're nice and perpendicular. I wanna take the top down so that it's perfectly flat all the way down. This is a very industrial planer. It's not one you see every day. So we're lucky to have big machines like this in the shop. I'm gonna go a little bit bigger just in case there's some high spots. Send it through and go from there. Just, just took a little nibble. That tells me I'm real close. Now I'm gonna come up about a sixteenth of an inch at a time. There we go. Decent flat top, some bottom there. I kind of like this the way it is. I think we're good. Yeah, I got a nice flat bottom, flat top. I'm gonna chop off the sides, probably somewhere around here, here with a chainsaw. We're gonna start sanding. Sweet. Yeah, we got about a six inch thickness, which is fantastic. Most people end up having like a three or four foot fireplace and they have like a six foot wall and they end up wanting something right in between, like right at five feet. That seems to be like the, the common denominator. We have something around six by eight by 60 inches. So I think for this particular beam, I have enough right here. If I cut it right there and I cut it right here to give me a nice 60 inches and that'll look really nice. All right, using the flat point on the backside as a reference, I'm gonna cut myself a line like that right there so I can see a little line right there for when I'm chainsawing. So it's really, really important when you're using a chainsaw to make cuts that you use a brand new blade, especially in something like oak. I wanna cut through this and keep it really straight. The power of the saw may be not so necessary uh, to get anything like super brutal. This is just a really tiny steel saw. Uh, we are going to cut through this with a brand new chainsaw blade that I just put on there and I'm gonna eyeball it now I'm gonna I'm good at this so I'm gonna try to make it as smooth and easy as possible when you're using a chainsaw you don't want to force it too much or you'll end up having a bunch of drift so I'm gonna cut through this really nice and easy so I can get a super straight cut on the edges I'm gonna check that for square. That's awesome. This way, we're, <laughs> that's really square for a chainsaw cut. We're about a 16th of an inch out, which is totally acceptable. So I'm, I'm glad, that's awesome. Let's do the next side. Make myself a little mark. I'm gonna put this here. I'm just gonna draw a line, just like that for me to follow.
You notice I'm not running this at full speed. I have a better time cutting if I'm about halfway. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a pocket. This, this pocket's gonna be about yay deep, about three quarters of an inch. That's gonna allow us to put a piece of wood in there, which we call a French cleat. It's got a 45 degree angle, and we put the other 45 degree angle piece on the wall, and when you hang your mantle, you just kinda let gravity do it, and it'll suck it into the wall. So in order to make this flush with any surface, we're gonna have to route out this pocket, or in this case, dado it out, and then we're gonna have to insert that piece of wood. So right now, Rogelio's setting this up, now a dado blade is different from a regular saw blade. It's multiple blades that are stacked together. You see this one right here? That is a, that is a big giant gnarly dado blade and this guy's gonna spin around and all these different blades are gonna take a big chunk out of it. And we're gonna move this fence back each time so that we can take more chunks and more chunks and more chunks until we have this really nice big, what they call a dado out of the back of this. Yeah. Right now he's testing the width and he's testing the depth. So three quarters? Three quarters. quarter by one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What he's gonna do is he's gonna push this back. A little more. You wanna go to the line, right? Yeah. He's gonna stop before the blade comes out the other side. And we're gonna rock it. Right there. This is nice to have two guys doing this. Much easier. Each time he does this, it's getting a little bit more and a little bit more, and we can take some of this chip out, no problem. We're trying to hog all this material out so we can get that cleat in there. We actually do French cleats so much that we have a dedicated table saw outside with a dado blade just for French cleats. <laughs> uh... At this point, now I've got the basic pocket for this done. I'm going to take this inside, and we're gonna start sanding it, and distressing it, and turning it into something that's ready for finish. Ew. All right, so the next step is gonna be sanding. Now, I use a random orbit sander, but not just any orbit sander. I've gone through so many electric sanders over the years um, that I just kind of give up on them. And so we have a really powerful uh, air compressor here in the shop, and we use air sanders. This is a six inch PSA, uh, which is basically the stick-on kind of six-inch disc. And it's an air sander made by Dynabraid. This is my favorite uh, sander to use. Variable speed, they last forever, but you really need a good air compressor to run them because they are, they are monsters. Now, one of the other things that I do that maybe is a little bit of an industry secret <clears throat> is I don't buy regular sandpaper. These are a little expensive, but these are a cloth back paper that I, that I have made for me. And this one is an 80 grit, which is gonna be our first step. This is 120 grit, which would be our second step. And then for finish, we're gonna go with a 180 grit. If you're going for a really, really gloss finish or something, you might go to 220 and then carry on beyond. But with reclaimed wood and with the kind of look that I'm gonna go for in a flat lacquer, the 180 is gonna be plenty. So in order to use a PSA instead of a hook and loop, what you do is you just peel this back and you can see the cloth right there, right? This is a really good strong cloth back. Now I'm just going to look, center it, boom, I'm set. 
Now there are several different types of random orbit sanders. When you get into, into the nicer industrial heavy duty stuff, they're gonna have a 3 8 inch orbit, they're gonna have a 3 16 inch orbit, and they'll have a 3 32 inch orbit. And that's, that's the secondary orbit. Besides spinning, it's that secondary orbit with the little swirls. With a 3 8 you're gonna hog off a lot of material. With a 3 16 it's like somewhere in between. It's like the Goldilocks of sanders. 3 32 is for like finished sanding and things like that. So almost all of them that I use are 3 16 I'm gonna hook this up and we're gonna go in. Now I've got 80 grit on there because I wanna hog off some stuff. And uh, so we're gonna just jump right in. <laughs> What I'm looking for is basically just to get through the surface, get rid of the splinters. I really like this live edge and I like the contrast it provides. So I'm just gonna get into some of these cracks, get rid of some of this old splintery junk that would fall off anyway, and reveal the wood underneath so that I can put a really cool finish on there. Sometimes you're going to run into some soft spots like this area right here where some of this was rotted away. And so what I'm going to do with this area is I'm just going to hit it with a hammer, see what I can knock off. That's too soft to put any finish on, too soft to sand. I'm just going to hit it and knock it out of there. What's great is I've got a live edge beam so it just looks like more live edge. This is an angle grinder with a finer wire wheel. You want to have a guard on if you can because these little wires when you're hitting stuff like to fly out and hit things. So it's a good idea to, to try to have a guard on there so it's not smacking you in the belly or throwing it back at you and always wear safety glasses. I'm gonna go over this whole live edge until I feel like I got all the big, big chunks done. I'm gonna round off this really awesome looking knot on the front, just so it kind of blends a little better. The 80 grit really takes a bite out of it, so it doesn't take very long before you can really shape it. And I'm gonna curve that in. What I'm going to try to do is be real conscientious of the joiner marks. So sometimes there's little ripples that happen where the jointer uh, or the planer made little knife marks. And I'm watching the surface really closely for any of those so I can get rid of them. They won't show through on the finish. Now, if you don't want swirl marks with these guys, because that's what happens all the time with swirl marks. If you lay this flat on a flat surface and you sand, you're not going to get as many swirl marks. If you curve like this, you're gonna get tons of them. So if you just be patient, keep that nice and flat, you're gonna be much happier later. So this tattered up old sander is a belt sander. It's, uh, it's got a four inch belt on it that I can use to kind of speed through taking down some of these planer marks, make it easier on myself. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use this real quick to take care of this surface because I have a few little divots I'd like to get rid of. Now these ends that I did with the chainsaw, I want to kind of blend in too. So I'm going to hit this end right here. <coughs> I want to see some of this rough sawn, you know, mark that I made with the chainsaw. I like that it's rough. I'm going to hit it with the 80 grit, but I want to leave a bunch of that. End grain is a lot harder to sand than the long grain. This is the end grain. It's where the tree is facing this direction. It's the direction all of the all the sap runs. The the tree drinks that direction. So it's got a bunch of holes and the fibers are facing like this and so when you're sanding them they like to bend and it takes a lot more time to sand than the long grain where you're sanding like this. Now I'm just going to fade all this in. And now I'm going to go to 120 grits which is a finer pattern and I'm going to end up 
uh, at 180, which is going to be the finest that I'm going to go today. All right, let's make this puppy smooth as a baby's body. Switching to 180 for our final pass here. It's gonna be beautiful. And I'm gonna show you a custom finish technique you've never seen before. It's pretty, it's all the beetle holes. Sometimes it makes it soft and funky, and I just think stuff like this looks so cool because it's got so much history, story. Even after being chopped down and lived in for however many hundreds of years, eaten by bugs, this tree still is given. Still becoming something beautiful. Inside of every one of these little beetle holes is, is little sawdust that's been there for a long time. I'm gonna hit it with air just to blow out a bunch of the junk that's sitting there so it doesn't fall out after I finish it. Uh, you can do all the different Minwax colors. I'm sure if you want to do a wipe on, there's all sorts of ways to make this super colorful and beautiful. I want a little contrast out of this, so I'm going to do something that's a little bit more of an industry secret. Uh, in the Home Depot uh, paint section, you'll find this cheap, quick color stuff. It's like 99 cents. And it's a really thin black spray paint. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create contrast in this by first wiping the entire thing in black paint. When I come back over it, I'm gonna clean it off with acetone and it's gonna clean off all the paint that was on the surface, but it's gonna leave all the black and all the little places inside. So it's gonna give me a really high contrast finish before I put it on my stain. So I'm just gonna shake this can up and I'm literally going to spray paint this thing, which makes me feel so bad when you're first doing it. But basically I'm just gonna cover this whole thing in black paint. And I'm trying mostly to get into the nooks and crannies, everything down in deep. All these little hand-hewn notches, everything in there, we wanna get them nice and deep. And don't worry about spraying too much or too little or making it run, it really doesn't matter at this point. We're just trying to get a really nice black paint inside of all those little edges. And it would be a really good idea when you're spraying these things to have a mask. Um, if I could get any right now because of the COVID-19 situation, I would be wearing one. But uh, I am saving all the masks for the guys, taking one for the team. So, so I'm just going to take a shop rag and I'm going to soak it with acetone. And you see this beam right here, the dark beam? We're going to scrape off all of the, all the paint in the loose areas first. So I'm going to get this rag nice and soaking wet with acetone. And just start wiping this away and see what happens is all that stuff on the top lets go and all the stuff that was dark in the in the little pockets stays and so we're gonna get this really cool high contrast thing going on with the finish we'll rub some of that in here oh it's so cool All right, so I mixed up a little bit of our stain. I'm just gonna take this and wipe this on here. Give it a little bit more, more of a warm color. In some of these spots where I have a little bit of that sawdust shown, I'm just gonna blot it, make it a little thicker. Trying to get too many cloth fibers stuck in those or get any splinters. <laughs> All right, so I found a mask. Thank goodness, because I'm about to spray some pre-cat lacquer and this stuff is pretty and pretty gnarly. So uh, what I'm using right now, I've got a Binks SV100. This is just a really simple gun you can pick up. We have some nicer guns, but I'm just gonna shoot a really simple high build flat 
this will do the trick. It's gravity fed and you need to have good air. And I'm using a Sherwin-Williams pre-cat flat lacquer right now. So I'm gonna give it a nice build off the beginning. Uh, we're gonna scuff in between and then I'm gonna throw a couple more coats on. You want to act like a printer. You want to kind of go past the edge and then come back to it again. So in between coats, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this spongy 800 grit that I've got, and that's to scuff in between. I want to create a layer for the lacquer to stick to, and I also want to get rid of any kind of dust that may have settled on the top because we're not in a spray booth. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit the top like this, and you'll see it looks kind of whitish when I do this. We're just going to hit this, try to take away any fuzz that was there and just kind of scuff the top, give it something to stick to on the next, next go around. All right, I'm going to shoot it again. You don't have to do tons of coats, just that first coat really gets in there and it kind of soaks into the wood. The next coat is creating a build and I kind of want to create a nice thick sheen on here. I want it to look like it's been lacquered. So, see some little fuzzies I want to get rid of? Right there. We are done with the, the actual mantle itself. This is all good. Once it dries, it's gonna have a nice matte finish now. Um, I'm gonna measure it up and we are gonna move in there and start building a French cleat. All right, so this French cleat pocket right here is about three and a half inches, which is smaller than I usually like to make them. Actually just a little, a little over three and a half, but right about three and a half. So I've gotta make sure that I have enough room that I can put the French cleat in, take the other piece, set it in, and let it move up. That's really tight space, so we're gonna make a couple of small French cleats, and they need to be out of something really hard so it's nice and strong. Right now I'm gonna take this piece of white oak. White oak is really strong, and uh, I'm gonna mill this down to three quarters of an inch. We're gonna start making our, uh, our French cleat material out of this, because this is gonna be nice and sturdy. All right, so I got about 45 inches of space, and I've got three and a half inches vertical, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this easy on myself before I start planning and just go ahead and cut this somewhere real close to 45. I don't need to be super exacting on the chop saw here. All right, and now I'm gonna go and plane this down to three quarters of an inch. Over to the joiner, joint one edge. So when this, when this goes up on the wall, there's gonna be a cleat side and there's gonna be the one that goes into the actual uh, mantle itself. The one that goes into the mantle itself, I can make a little bit smaller, but I probably wanna make the one on the wall a little bit bigger. I only have three and a half inches of space with this one and so I have very tight space and if I've got a 45, and a 45 and it has to go like this, I've got to have enough room for the 45 to go in and down. So I need to take an inch away from that three and a half, so now I'm at two and a half. And then I need to get the, uh, the 45 in there as well. So I'm going to make each piece uh, approximately like an inch and a quarter in order to make this work. So I'm gonna set up my, uh, my table saw. I'm gonna set this at about two and five eighths. Perfect. 
Perfect. And then I'm going to go ahead and cut this right down the middle like that. You're right in the kickback spot. All right. Now the reason I started off doing this at two and five eighths is because I'm going to get about an inch and a half uh, each direction if I go ahead and have an eighth of an inch of kerf and I send this guy through. So I'm just going to find a happy medium here. Nice place where, uh, where I feel like this will cut and no matter what this will always match this one because I'm cutting them at the same time. So we'll get a nice thicker one off this side and a thinner one off that side. And when I send this through, I don't want to do this with my hands. I need to find a little piece of wood to push this through with. I don't want to chop off my fingers. Even though this is a saw stop, I don't want to test it. All right. And there we have it. One of the things about oak is that if you try to drill through it with just a screw, uh, it'll split. So I'm going to take a countersink and I'm going to go ahead and run through this side and create a couple holes where my uh, screws are going to be going into the mantle. Probably put five. And the countersink creates an extra little bevel there so that the screw can go all the way in and stay flat. This is nice and dry. It looks really awesome. I'm going to go ahead and flip that down. I've got square head screws that we have here in our shop. I'll line this guy up. Is that going to be the top? Yeah, I like the top. I like that as the top. Boom. All right. And now, just to make sure this stays straight, I'm gonna stick this in here, which is gonna become the cleat that goes in the wall. There's plenty of room I can see to slide that in and go up. I'm gonna put those in there. And there you have it, one completed mantle. We'll take this in the shop, do a couple of photos for you, show you what it looks like close up, and then uh, we hope to see you next time on Porter Barnwoods Live Workshops. We'll see you guys later. Hey guys, uh, thanks for joining in today. I hope you had a good time. Uh, Jesse and I, this was our first attempt. Say hi, Jesse. <laughs> this is our first attempt at uh, putting together a little live video from the studio. We're all, uh, we're all here in the showroom where there's not a lot going on. Uh, in the workshop, there's a bunch going on. We're still manufacturing out there, but uh, he and I have been putting together all sorts of fun videos. So stay tuned, because we're probably gonna do some more stuff like this in the not too distant future. Um, I think this is fun. It's a new thing for us, and uh, I'm excited. <laughs> You're funny. All right, so share it. Uh, continue to help us uh, push this kind of stuff. This is great. It's a, it's a great new way for us to try to get in front of your face and uh, try to teach you some fun things. And once all this stuff is over, uh, hopefully you guys will come down here and visit us and have a good time. Um, thank you guys so much, too, for all the homeschoolers and families that had come down uh, the last couple weeks 
um, for the wood by the pound thing that we were doing. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you send us uh, some of the, the project photos that you have. Um, we're looking forward to seeing those. I'm going to let you guys go. You've been very patient to watch us this long. So hope you have a good one. Until then, Thomas Porter at Porter Barnwood signing off. You guys have a good one. <laughs> Jesse says bye too. Bye, bye guys.